Stop giving clients what they ask for and ask them what they need and ask them why. Welcome to the Cleaning Up Podcast, Millionaire Secrets of the Home Services Industry, brought to you by me, Ron Holt. CEO and founder of Two Maids and a Mop, America's fastest growing cleaning company. I get a chance to sit down with home service industry pros and other entrepreneurial leaders so they can share their stories, their insight, their experiences. It's so much fun. You're going to learn so much. And you're going to be inspired to take your small business into a national brand just like I did. Let's jump right into the interview. With us today is Steve Tim, Steve's for you guys out there listening may may not be a name that you're aware of, but let me tell you a little bit a little bit about this guy. He is an amazing rock star, in my opinion. So he's a self-described ugly kid from the outskirts of London. Um, wasn't born into luxury, uh, but kind of works with people who want luxurious items today. Um, he's the founder of Bluefish, also the author of a great book uh, called Blue Fishing, which is the art of uh, making remarkable experiences. And in our world that we're living in today, as you know, all we've been really thinking about and tossing around here in the Two Maids and a Mop world over the last several months is what we can do for our clients and our employees to create remarkable, unique experiences. And all that talking is great, but we have someone today in Steve Sims that can go deeper. He can talk to us about all of these things that he's done in the past. Believe it or not, he's done some really crazy things. Um, he's been... He's allowed uh, his clients to be serenaded by really famous musicians and artists like Andrea Bocelli. He's had people married at the Vatican. He's even allowed people the opportunity to dive the wreck of the Titanic. I mean, just so many, so many cool experiences. And his book is, is a heck of a uh, entertaining piece as well. A lot of education is in there as well. So Steve, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So I know someone out there that just heard that introduction has got to be thinking, what in the world? Um, how, how does someone get into this business of, of making remarkable experiences come true? So, so kind of take back in time and, and all the way back to those streets of London. Uh, I know eventually they ended up in, in Hong Kong. So if you don't mind, tell us that backstory. Yeah, I was going to say that was a massively open-ended question. A, a bit scary. Um, it's, but I'm going to answer it. It was a huge question before you, you finalized, uh, finalized it down to my start. But I get to where I am, or I've got to where I am, should I say better grammatically, um, because I have care and simplicity. I don't overcomplicate anything. You've met me. You know me. You've seen me around. You know what I'm about. I'm about impact, the shortest route and caring for what I'm doing. Now, when I was in East London, I was uh, left school at the age of 15, worked on my parents' brick lane uh, building sites. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But like all entrepreneurs, all business owners, all self-starters, sometimes we know when things are not right more than when we know when things are right. So I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew it sure as hell wasn't going to be to sit on a building site and it wasn't going to be to... Uh, do that kind of stuff every day because it's London. It very rarely su uh, suns. Um, it's always raining. It's always cold. It's bloody horrible. Um, you don't live in England for the weather. So I needed something different. And so I then started my journey and my quest to find out where was my hole that my peg would fit in. Um, and in doing so, I made a ton of mistakes. I was a truck driver. I was a security guy. I was a doorman. I delivered cakes. I did door-to-door -door insurance sales. I did telephone sales rooms. I did a whole bunch of different things trying to find out, all right, where, where do I excel? Where is my thing? Um, funny enough, I got a job as a stockbroker when I was working in London because a friend of mine worked for the bank. I got a job as a trainee stockbroker and they flew me out to Hong Kong and I thought I'd hit the jackpot. I thought this is it, boy, you know, it's, it's uh, Wall Street. I'm going to have a red Ferrari in a couple of days, you know, phone on a suitcase. It's going to be all that kind of stuff. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. And um, didn't quite pan out like that. I landed on the Saturday, did orientation on the Monday and I was fired on the Tuesday. So... Um, <laughs> I, I'm now stuck at what I thought was my lowest ebb. I actually thought this is it. And one night 
I was out at a bar, which I seem to do most nights. I was out of this bar drinking on my own. And this lady came out that owned the bar and she said to me, can you go in there and sort out two of your people? Um, I didn't know anyone. So I don't know how the hell they were my people, but they were a bunch of white fellas over in the corner getting Larry. So for some reason she thought, you know, we must know each other. Um, so she asked me to go and sort them out or she'd get her boys to kick them out. And I told her, look, I don't know who these people are. And she said, well, they're, they're, they're from your country. So you go and sort it out. And I was like, all right. And the clincher was, she said, you do that, I'll pay for your drinks. Now, I had no job, so that seemed like a brilliant opportunity to me. So I was like, yeah, all right. So I went over there, asked the guys to leave, said I didn't want any trouble. Um, you know, please go. And I said to him, I said, come back tomorrow and I'll buy you your first drink. You know, but leave now and uh, pay your bill and let's all, you know, forget this night got out of hand. And they did. And so she asked me to be the doorman. Um and the funny thing was, from what I thought was the lowest point of my existence, I now had a soapbox that I could watch humanity. I could watch how people are in interacted. The door became a great place to play a game. Now, we've all heard of something called gamification. If you want your kids to do something, make it fun. You know, create a game. How fast can you clean your room, kids? You know, how, how fast can you stack those pots, you know? Make a game of something and people are more engaged. To keep my head straight, my game was, can I recognize the point of the people coming in tonight? You know, are they celebrating a contract, a hen party, a get together with friends, a first date, an anniversary? You know, the guy's looking to pull or the girl's looking to pull. Um, are they looking to get into trouble? You know, I was using body language and posture to guess what these people were here for. And as they were coming to the door, I'd be like, hello, ladies, what are you here for tonight then? And, you know, trying to validate, did I get it right? Oh, I was celebrating my friend's wedding. I'd be like, bingo, got it right, you know? So I started doing that, and then I took it a step further. The classic line, and I said to you at the beginning, I'm a simple person with no long-term goals with a lot of short-term. I have a great saying from a friend of mine, Ari Mizell, get going then get good, but get going first. Don't over plan, don't overthink, start walking. So I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute. If I want to be rich, which I did, I needed to know rich people. Because at the moment, I didn't. And so how could I possibly ever end up being rich? So what I did was I started to talk to the more affluent people that came to the club with the idea of asking them one day, hey, how come you're rich and I'm not? That's all I wanted to do. The funny thing was to get their attention because I knew where all the best parties were, I would recommend where all the best parties And I'd say to them, hey, do you want me to get you in? And they'd be like, yeah. And I learned from a very early age, they don't pay unless they pay attention. Oh, sorry, they, they don't pay attention unless they pay. So I used to go, oh, I can do it for you, you know. 500 bucks, 200 bucks. And those prices went up. I was soon asking for $5,000 to get them into private parties and they were paying. And I was realizing that the effort it took for me to sell something for $100 was the same effort it took me to sell something for $5,000. So my whole focus had been, how can I get hold of rich clients and ask them how to be rich so I can be rich without realizing it I actually invented my own industry and we were actually one of the first ever personal private concierge firms in the planet. The, one of the best stories I can remember from the book is, is that infamous night when, when this idea of blue fishing um, just sort of popped into your head. You had, like you had mentioned just now, you, you sort of were blue fishing before you knew what blue fishing was, but how, what does the name even mean? Like, how did you get to, the, to a place to call it that term? Well, I didn't. Um, and that's an absolute fact. And when I say I didn't, we even set up a whole new company, not even, not even thinking this was a company. So to give you the extension, I started sending people to other people's parties. These parties turned into like movie, and this is in Hong Kong, movie premieres. You know, like you've got the major jewelry stores and the major cars. If there's an unveiling of a new Mercedes or Ferrari or Maserati, they have a party. And I could get people into them. I started getting people into parties. Then I started throwing my own parties. 
got more money that way. So I started hiring yachts and penthouses and mansions. Started throwing these amazing parties, but only inviting rich people that would have to pay me to come. Um, but here was the funny thing. I would stand on the door because I, I never wanted anyone to know that it, I was in charge of the party because I thought they're going to look at me and think, you look too much of a thug. You don't know what you're doing. Um, and Because if anyone can't see me, for one, you're lucky. <laughs> but um, there's a reason I'm called Ugly Sims. I'm basically 240 pound of piercings, tattoos, and ride around on a motorbike. So you, you've got that in your head now. Um, With a whiskey bottle, right? <laughs> there you go, and a whiskey bottle uh, occasionally <laughs> kicking around somewhere. Um, but what happened was I started to... Uh, have a bit of a laugh with it again. I always try to have a smile with anything I do. And if you can make people smile as they walk through the front door, they end up smiling when they're inside. Most people, you know, focus on people once they're inside, focus on them before they get inside, and then they walk in with the right attitude. Okay, so I know it sounds silly, but I used to send out, and this was when faxes were being used. So we used to send out a fax, thanking them for their payment and telling them where they could go for the party and then telling them that they had to answer or come up with uh, um, the answer to one of these either lines, quips. So it'd be things like, name the line, and this was a tough one. This one really caught people out. Bear in mind, there were no smartphones then. Name the lion out of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. And so they would literally have to come up to the doorman and go uh, and name the lion, and then we'd let him in. And one of the lines that we had, um, only because I've i always loved Dr. Zeus, uh, I think the guy's crazy and, and genius. Um, I used to say, finish this sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. So people would come up and just go, blue fish. And we'd go, oh, go on in. The lion one was hilarious because people would come up and they'd be like, oh, I, I don't know. Is it, is it lion? You know, and of course it wouldn't be, but because they were laughing, everyone be half behind them is laughing. We'd be like, no, it's not lion. In you go, you know, and we would have this joke, but everyone, it became synonymous that we had this kind of fun at the front door, which was unheard of. You don't go to a nightclub and enjoy yourself at the front door. You enjoy yourself inside. But people suddenly started doing this. So we thought, hang on, we've got a lot of clients. We're throwing a lot of parties. We've got a lot of fax numbers, a lot of phone numbers. We should start to make this real. We should actually start taking this seriously. And it was my wife that said, you know, you need to start taking this seriously because unlike a hobby, you've now got a business. And we did. You know, we were throwing parties, you know, two or three times a month for, you know, anywhere up to 200 of the richest people in Asia. So this was a proper business now. Um, and we didn't have, you know, we, we used to, oh, yeah, send the money to Steve Sims. This is my bank account. We never had anything set up properly. So when we actually looked at doing the company, we made the first mistake like most entrepreneurs do. We overthink things and we screw it up. So we came up because we were, we knew where all the fun was and we knew where all the secret access was. We looked through, you know, uh, books and TVs. One of the guys came in and said to us, hey, have you heard of something called a trianon? And we, I, I, I'll ask you, have you ever heard of a trianon? Uh, that's the first time I've heard that term. <laughs> no. So the trianon is the court for the Greek gods. Now, at the time, the Greek gods ruled and knew everything. But when they disagreed with each other or they went into battle against each other, the trianon you're going to love this for, for precociousness, was the final word on anything. So they knew everything and they were the final say on everything. So we I thought call that, that my wife usually. So that. Well, exactly. Yeah. So I thought try on. Yeah, that's precocious enough. So we actually set up a company called try on and people would phone me up and they'd go, Hey, you know, is that, is that, and they would say, is that that bluefish company? Because they would remember the password. And no one ever asked us if we were Aslan, which was the name of the line. No one would ever ask. But the bluefish thing stuck in people's mind. And people would go, oh, I went to this party the other night. And it's, it's like, it's this, you say bluefish at the front door. And so we became the blue. So people would find us, is that that bluefish company? And I would go, nope. 
this is Trianon. How can we help you? And do you know what they would do? They would hang up because they were looking for bluefish and we were this precocious bunch of idiots called Trianon. And it was my, um, this pretty little um, Chinese girl that said to me, you know your bluefish, don't you? And I said, what do you mean? She went, you've used that password so many times now that they think you're bluefish. And we were like, oh, crap. So we weren't thinking, we were doing, and then repairing as we went along. Um, and wow. that's what happened. We literally did a name change, changed the name of the company from Tryan on the Bluefish, started answering yes. And here was the beautiful thing. Because Bluefish didn't mean anything, we now had the luxury to assign it with anything we wanted. So we used to say, people say, what is Bluefish? And we'd say, it's an attitude, it's a lifestyle. And we would make up these one-liners, which were more vague than could be vague. But basically, we were able to create it. And the big thing that happened was every time I did anything, and we'll probably end up talking about the Florence story some point in this podcast, any time I've ever done anything for a client, I've wanted to match what the client wanted and then provide what he needed, which are two different things. It means you have to listen to what the client's asking for but give them what they really desire, what they really lust for. And this means taking it to the next level. And I had clients come to me going, hey, Steve, I went to this concert the other day and I bluefished my way backstage. Or I bluefished it because I then came in by helicopter or I had this private access to a restaurant. Or, and I'd have um, clients say to me, oh, I did a birthday party for my daughter. I didn't do it just as a birthday party. I, made the, I was bluefishing it all the way through. She had a great time. And all of a sudden, we became an adjective. We became an action point. And it was quite surprising. I never invented Bluefish to be that. But people needed it, grabbed it, and the rest is history. Well, like you said, now everyone knows it. I know it. Bluefishing is the art of making things happen. Um, so why don't we give these guys some examples? Uh, I've, I've heard, I've listened to you in other podcasts, definitely read the book. So I know some of these stories. Maybe there's some I haven't heard, but let's prove to everyone listening that you can make things happen. So if you don't mind, give us a couple of really cool stories to just sell the, sell the audience on you. So I mentioned, I, I, I sewed the nugget of uh, Florence. I had a very affluent client that contacted me, wanted to show off to his mom and dad, or to his future mother and father-in-law, uh, that you know he was powerful and connected, so he contacted me to set up a, a cool restaurant in Florence. Um, again, people say to me, "Have you ever failed?" No. The reason I've never failed is because I've never ever given the client what they asked for. I said earlier, I've given them what they want and desire and lust for, which are two different things. So I could have easily gone onto like the Italian open table and booked him up a really cool restaurant, and you know, job done. But that wasn't good enough. So what I did was I contacted. Uh, some people that I knew, very powerful people in Florence, I ended up taking over the Accademia de Galleria. So, uh, yeah, the Accademia de Galleria, which is the museum that houses Michelangelo's David. And I actually had them close at three o'clock in the afternoon, clear the place out until one o'clock in the morning. At nine o'clock that evening, my client turned up, walked into a museum, all on his own with his fiance and a mother and father-in-law and this straggler that had turned up. And they had a dinner for six set up at the feet of Michelangelo's David. And halfway through that pasta, I had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade him as a surprise. <laughs> so I, I like to see, okay, that's good, but how can we make it better? Um, and we had a, another client of mine, the guy introduced me uh, via a, a mutual friend of ours, Richard Branson. And uh, he wanted to meet the rock band Journey. That's what he wanted to do. You know, meet them. And I right. said, why? And he gave me this story about how throughout his life, ups and downs, basically, you know, for the sake of keeping things short, everybody's life. You know, we have the goods, we have the bads, we have the rich, we have the poor, we have the relationships, we have the breakups. But every point of his life, he had Journey in the back of his head because when he was in college, he actually sang for a Journey cover band to make money. So Journey was basically, without them realizing it, the theme tune and the cover to his life. 
So he's quite successful now, to say the least. And he wanted to meet them and thank them for that. So again, I went forward and I thought, there's got to be more to this. There's got to be a way of making this more exciting. And so we ended up actually having him brought up on a stage in San Diego, live or what was at the time called the Cricket Amphitheater. And he sang four tunes as the shortest term lead singer of the rock band journey. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That is more than making things happen. That's absolutely making dreams come true, you know, which, which, uh, which is really what our entire existence is about. You know, we're, we're, we're all human beings. We all – have different ways of life and heritage. Uh, you know, there's all, what, we're different in other words, but the one thing we really all share in common, we want, we want to chase dreams. You know, we, we don't want to just exist. And the fact that you're able to put those things together, I can't imagine the amount of just sort of self gratitude you get from making so many positive experiences occur for people across this world. Uh, what's it like? To, <laughs> yeah. You've actually, Without, well, I don't know, without realizing, or maybe you do, you've just uttered the most powerful words in the planet and getting more powerful by day. You see, the two, there's, been a, there's been a few things that have been happening since 2000. And basically, we're all bitching about social distancing and we can't get close to each other and we can't talk to each other and we can't connect and we can't shake hands and hug. Well, I hate to wake you up on this, but you started doing this 20 years ago with the invention of Facebook, MySpace, Friendster, and every other social platform that taught you how not to be. And so as years have gone on, we've stopped being social. We've stopped interacting. How many people do you go into a restaurant now and you see them at the restaurant table and they're all on their phones? You see the top of the forehead. Right. If you want to be arrested, like you're some kind of mugger, rapist, or, or burglar, go into a coffee shop, and the person that orders the coffee in front of you, the second they step to the right-hand side to wait for that mocha lock or frappuccino or whatever it is, try to strike up a conversation with them, and they'll look at you like a rapist. They will literally look at you about what the hell are you doing? Because we don't communicate anymore. Another thing that's bad is we become order givers. We are fine-tuned now to give orders and uh, expect a response. Siri, Alexa, Amazon, we say, send me this. I want this. What's this? What's that? We become very transactional in our mentality. And everyone's sitting there worried about AI taking over the world. Things only take over when you let them. And the one thing that AI cannot do is dream. The only reason that the great people are doing fantastical, impossible things is because they dream them first. And the dumb thing is, we're scared. If you go up to someone, I, I'm sorry to preach, but you kicked it off. It's your fault. <laughs> preach on. <laughs> <laughs> if you go up to your best mate and go, hey, what's your, what's your biggest dream? you will get two responses. You'll get the first one that says, oh, I want a hot tub with all the Victoria's Secrets models in it. You'll get the knee-jerk, sounds cool, funny, flippant remark. And if you pursue, if you go, yeah, that sounds great. But once you've done that, what's your dream? Now you're getting down to someone's core and people don't like being that vulnerable. People don't like to. So what do we do? We hold them in. And we dilute the dream. The guy that wanted to meet Journey could afford it. But instead of going, hey, I want Journey to teach me to how to sing, don't stop, believe. Instead of dreaming big, and why should we not? There's no parameters or limits on it. No one says, whoa, up there, fella. You can't have that dream tonight. That's a little bit too abstract. That's a little bit too sexy. That's a little bit too wild. Know your place. You don't have a place when it comes to dreams. Dreams are your place. But instead, people dilute for the fear of looking stupid, looking vulnerable. So you've got to think that when someone's coming to you, they're already scared. Now, I don't care what it is. And you're all sitting there going, well, that's good for you. I clean carpets. I bake cakes. I have a hairdresser. I coach people. In fact, my latest client that I just took on a couple of weeks ago owns a plumbing company in Southern California. One of my other clients owns a bakery. And I said to him, 
Stop giving clients what they ask for and ask them what they need and ask them why. They say, oh, I can't do that. People come in to me and they want a cake. And I say, yeah, I'll do that when you want. I said, no, stop doing that. When they come and ask you what they want, and he contacted me and he said, a client came in and said, I want a red cake and I wanted this shade. And he brought in like a little picture and it was red. And he said, so what do you want? He said, I just want a red cake. And he said, okay, why is that important? He actually asked the client that, and the client turned around as well, it's from my dad's birthday. Okay, then why is red important to him? He's like, well, he's getting on in life, and he always used to love the old Ferraris. And he said, well, okay, then let's give him what he wants. Let's get some little Ferrari cars and put them around the bottom. On the top of the cake, let's put the Cavallino horse. The original color of Ferrari and the badge has always been yellow. So then let's do an assortment at the bottom of yellow cupcakes. And he came up with this. He dreamt this idea of this guy. The guy went nuts. It turned out the guy knew someone at a local newspaper and he actually told this guy about this, this baker that thinks and questioned him when he ordered a cake. People today don't tell you what they really want. They tell you what makes, it, what makes them look smart for you to hear. You know, it, it also requires almost a DNA shift. Um, you have to listen. You have to listen to people to really understand what they want, number one, and what they don't know, what they don't know, you know, what they may want, but not know how to actually articulate that. Um, and I believe, we talked about this offline, but I believe that this could transcend more than just one component of a business. And we're talking mostly about client experiences. And in, uh, in this plumber's case, you're talking about his customer's experiences. And it sounds phenomenal. But in a business, there are actually two customers. One's the customer. The other is the employee that's performing the service or selling the product. And in our world, you know, I, I have my own dream, Steve. And, and my dream is one day, one day um, in two maids of the mop world, we can defeat this notion that turnover is just part of our business. If I never hear that again, I'll, I'll, I'll be a happy man. But I've heard it now going on more than 17 years that in the residential cleaning industry, people are just a problem. And I believe that absolutely, and 17 years of time has proven that it is a problem. But part of the reason it's a problem is because the people working for us in our industry don't necessarily have uh, the framework um, or the just vision to think that they can also, also accomplish dreams. The business owners believe they can. They think they can clean a house and make money and use that money to chase their dreams. But the people working for them may not agree with that. And, and may have never even had the opportunity to actually dream, you know, what, what may look, you know, like down the, down the road or in the future. So, you know, how possible is it for this blue fishing strategy to not just work directly with clients, but also with employees of any business, even for a residential cleaning business like us? It's, it's a bit strange to answer the question because you just did. Um, I think it's imp how important is it for us to, to, to drink water and breathe air? You should look at it as a fundamental utility. You see, see a lot of people um, will look at your business and just go, ah, oh, you're, you're just there to do something else. You know, you're, you're there to do something. Just, just do it. You know, don't overthink. You know, don't engage me in a conversation. Just clean up. You're solving problems. You're giving something to someone that – let's be blunt, they could more than likely do themselves if they devoted the time and the energy to it. But then there's something that you have that you're not paying attention to. You have knowledge. You have the answers to the questions they have yet to ask. So when you go forward, and this, this is, I'm trying to keep it to your business, but I want it to be broad to anybody listening here. You are not paid for what you do. You are paid for what you know how to do. You are there to save the time because you know how to do it because you're the professional. There's one um, statement that I learned very early on in life and how much of a myth and bullshit it was. The customer is always right. Wrong. The customer doesn't know what they don't know. That's your job. 
So when you go along to a client and you say to the client, so what are you looking at doing? I'm looking over an XYZ done. Great. Ask them the most offensive question in the world. And some of you will be nervous about asking this question. But I want you to ask the most offensive question in the world. Why? You know, you may get someone to turn and go, well, they're dirty. Okay. Are they not? Because if I'm going to haul my stuff in here and pay attention to these rooms, surely we should be taking att paying attention to that over there. Nothing worse than having fresh paint on half the house and makes the rest of the house look bad. Let me see how I can help you save time. Maybe bring in treatment that means you haven't got to see me for another eight months instead of another three. You know stuff that they don't. Exploit your knowledge, increase your value, demonstrate your value, and you'll never argue an invoice again in your life. If anyone ever argues with you over the price tag, it's because you failed to demonstrate the value. Well, if you've got time, uh, I've got a couple of practical uh, case studies slash questions, whatever you want to call it, if, if, if you want to play the game with me. Uh, that, if, if you're up for the challenge? Well, you know I'm a bit tight on time, but I'll be honest with you, I'm enjoying myself. So um, <laughs> let's hit it. Go for it. All right, so we're going to start on the employee side, and we're going to round back to the customer here in a minute. So the age-old customer, or I'm sorry, the age-old employee meeting when the longtime employee walks into the manager or supervisor's office and goes, hey, Ron, I've been here for a few years. I've gotten a couple of uh, really nice 2.5% raises. Um, I think I deserve more. What can you do for me? How do you handle that? Uh, treat, treat that employee like a customer. How do you create a bluefish moment um, from, an, from a valued employee like that? All right, so that person has just walked in and asked, sort of, A's ain't getting get shit. And if he does, he's going to walk out saying thank you to the boss, okay? Worst position in the world. Why? Because you have established who is in power, okay? So let's tweak it a little bit, Ron, all right? So I walk in you. I'm your employee and you're my boss and I've been with you. How long have I been with you, Ron? Sorry, a couple of years. We've been here two years. I've, with, I've given okay, you a couple so, of raises, yeah. All right, so you've given me a couple of raises and uh, I've been with you for a couple of years. Okay, so I contact you and I say, hey, Ron, um, I've got a few things on my mind. Is there a chance we could have some time to chat? When's a good time for you? Okay. Yep. Don't just walk in off the street and side, uh, side smack them. Find a time to appoint a conversation. That's the first thing. Okay? You're establishing the playing field. So, Ron, can we get together next Tuesday at, say, 3 o'clock? And you say, yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. So then I walk in and I sit down. I go, hey, Ron, you know, thanks a lot. You know, I just had a couple of things. Look, I wanted to ask a question. You know, you know, you know we've been together for a while now, and I've really enjoyed – uh, learning from you and working on the company and, you know, establishing my worth and my value, keywords. But I need to ask you a question, Ron. Are you ready for it? I'm all ears. All right. Hey, Ron, I want to ask you a very serious question. What am I doing wrong? Yeah. And then shut up. Okay. Now, who's in control of that conversation at that point? You're right, man. It's totally it, – the, the position shifts for sure. Yeah. So, Ron, what, what am I doing wrong? Now, Ron's going to back up and go, oh, uh, now, bear in mind, he's had you employed for two years. And he's given you two raises. So, he sees value. And Ron's sitting there going, well, whew. Now, bear in mind, you've got to be in a position of strength. So before you ever walk in and open a question that can get you shot in the foot, you've got to be aware that, you know, you've not been going in late every day of the week. But he turns around and says, well, you, you're, always, you're always one of the first people here and you're always one of the last to leave and you, your customer service satisfaction. You know, I want to be the best I can, Mon. So I need to seriously ask you, what am I doing wrong? Challenge it as he's talking. You know, well, you, you, you get good. Is that good enough? You know, what can I do to make that better? Right. Hey, Steve, I just don't know what you could do to get it. You're doing great. Fantastic. I'd like to talk to you now about the pay. 
Now, Ron has just sat there and spent the last 15 minutes telling you why, why the sunshine comes out of your left nostril. And now he's going to look an absolute idiot by going back. I love it. I, I, I got to remember that, though, the next time that happens to me. <laughs> Well, you see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Those words, what did I do wrong? Those are the best, best positioning words. Remember that sentence. If you forget everything about this, remember the sentence. And remember, most definitely, you've got to shut up after you say it. But there's a great way that you can get referrals out of clients by asking that question. But anyway, I know you've got a couple of questions. So what, did that answer the first it one? It was phenomenal. I, I, yeah, that's worth the entire interview, honestly. And uh, you know, we, we've got mostly small business owners listening to the podcast right now. So you know, <laughs> the main thing to take away from that is uh, obviously you, you don't want to prepare yourself to say no, but you definitely want to make sure that that really interaction never occurs. You know, as the employer, you want to make sure that someone doesn't have to come into your office and have that conversation, but on to the customer, because I know your time's limited, but I'm, I'm really excited about this one. So in our business, recurring revenue is a huge part of our business. In fact, it's the main part of our business. It's what creates so much value in our industry. And most of our customers use us every week or every other week. Some use us every month, every now and then we get the, you know, the family that needs to, to prepare for a party or, or whatever, but most of our client base is recurring in nature. However, that doesn't mean they have to recur forever. And so attrition, customer attrition, um, is somewhat prevalent, not just with our business, but our entire industry, because it's just so easy, so simple to go ahead and, and move on to the other cleaning company that's $5 less expensive. That is way better because the neighbor says so. Uh, so we're working so hard here as a brand to, to create these really unique, remarkable experiences for our clients so that they don't want to have that interaction with their neighbor who says, my, my cleaning company is better. If there was one thing, uh, maybe, you, maybe you've hired a cleaning company yourself, but if there's one thing as a customer, you said it before, don't just clean their house, but do something else. Figure out what they don't even know they want and give it to them. What's one thing that we can do that can give us the opportunity or the uh, sort of framework to give people be more than just that house cleaning. <laughs> You're going to hate this Ron, and you may edit it out, but you've again answered the question, which everybody <laughs> ignores. Now I run a concierge firm for literally the richest people in the planet. And my website doesn't have a phone number or an email on it. And to be honest with you, two thirds of my clients don't even know I have a bloody website because I am a 100% referral based organization and you've just answered it yourself. And I'm going to help answer the question by giving you an example. Are you ready to play with me on this? Hey, I, I am. Let's do it. All right. So Ron, you're sitting, sitting at the bar and, um, you know, you you are you married? I am. Yep. Couple All right, what's your wife's yeah. name? Rachel. Rachel. All right. So here we go. Here's the game. We walk in, I walk into a bar, and you and Rachel are leaning against the bar having a conversation. And I walk up to Rachel and I go, hey, Rachel, how are you doing? My name's Steve Sims. I've worked with Elon Musk, Richard Branson, and the Pope. I've closed museums down in Florence and got my mate Andrea Bocelli to come in and serenade my clients while they're eating their pasta. I'm a big deal. How are you doing? And I put my hand out to shake her hand. What's Rachel's reaction going to be to that? Well... <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, she's going to be impressed, but maybe a, a little resistant just because you're a stranger to her and going, why is, why is this guy coming up to me at a bar with my husband next to me? Right. Okay. Bluntly, anyone else out there is going to be grimacing. If we were videoing this now, you'd be like, oh, God, who is this dick? This guy's full of himself. Oh, my God. You know, you're, it's, it's a repellent. Okay. But now let's play the game with a tweak, okay? You and Rachel are leaning up against the bar. I walk into the bar and I ignore you. Why shouldn't I? I have no idea who you are. And I walk up to the end of the bar. I order my old fashioned and you turn around to Rachel and you give her a little poke in the ribs and you go, Rachel, you see that guy at the end of the bar? He's worked with Elon Musk, the Vatican, Sir Richard Branson. He's worked with Andre Bocelli. He's closed down museums. 
that guy's a big deal. Now what's Rachel's reaction to me? Oh, she's wide open, receptive. Yeah, she's, she's open to having a conversation. and She wants to know more. But why? The information is exactly the same. So what's changed? I, I delivered the message beyond, rather than you. When you rewind this mess, when you rewind this podcast, as you started to talk about this this uh, question, and I turned off halfway through it to be honest, because you'd already answered it. You made the statement that the people are going with the other firm because the neighbour said that they were great and they were five dollars cheaper. It had bugger all to do with the five dollars. It had the fact that it came from a position of credibility. When you go to a client. Any client you've ever worked for, you go to them after a week later and you go, hey, how are you doing? How is everything? And you let them go, oh, it's lovely, it's great, it's thing. Yeah, thank you very much. And you go, hey, I need to ask you a question because I really take a pride in my job and I want to be the best I can. Can I ask you a question? What did I do wrong? It's the exact same question. Now, if I said to you, uh, if I said to you now, Ron, hey, how's this podcast been? Have you enjoyed me as a guest? What is the knee-jerk, quickest answer you're going to give me? Yeah, of course. It's phenomenal. Yeah, and you're going to be lovely and you're going to be nice because as human beings, we're, pre we're pre-directed to be nice to each other. Sure. We, we're already pre-engineered that, hey, he wants compliments. I'll give him a couple of compliments, even though I couldn't understand what he was saying through half of it. I'll be nice to him. <laughs> All right, and you're going to do that. But if I said to you, hey, Ron, you know, thanks for the podcast. I really enjoyed it, but I need to ask you a question. What did I do wrong? That opens up a different section of your, of your brain. You're now having to do this thing called think. You're not reacting. You're thinking. And so you're like, oh, um, well, uh, and you could say things like, well, you spoke a little fast or your mic wasn't very good. Any of those answers are going to help me towards my next podcast in any case. But when you say things, and again, think of your client that's got you um, cleaning their house. When they turn around and go, well, thanks, Ron, but no, you were great. You know, you came in on time and you were out earlier than you said. And you, well, you paid attention to those rooms I hadn't even thought about. And you recommended that stuff. Oh, my God, my house has been smelling fantastic ever since. When they start thinking and they give those answers, then you hit them with this. Mary, thank you very, very much for helping me keep my standards up. But I just wondered... What 10 people do you know that should know exactly what you just said? Mm. You see, most people don't get referrals because they don't ask for referrals. And again, asking for something, everything has to do about not the ask, but the positioning of the ask. Mary has just told you for 15 minutes why, why you are the greatest cleaner she has ever come across in her life. And now you've just asked her, what friends do you have that should know this? Now, don't you want to look after your friends? Don't you want to do, when your car's busted, you go to your mate, hey, do you know anyone that can fix my car? Again, sources of credibility. If someone spent money with you, there's nothing better. I've had people come up to me in a party. They have no idea who I am. They don't know what I do. And they've gone, hey, what do you do? And I've told them I own things like a gas station. Or I own a painting and decorating firm. Because I am not very good at introducing myself. Or I will sit there and go, oh, I saw you talking to Bobby. And they go, yeah, Bobby's a dear friend of mine. All right, go and ask Bobby what I do and then we'll have a drink after. You see, it's how you get introduced that's everything. Not what you say. It's the position of credibility. It's the source. It's the setup of how you've been explained. It's the positioning that's everything. Stop marketing. Stop branding. Stop promoting. Spend the next few days going over everyone that you've cleaned for in the last two years. Contact every single one of those and go, hey, 
What did I do wrong? Do you have 10 friends that should know that? And see how fast your business builds up. I don't advertise for my coaching programs. I don't advertise for my concierge. I am referral based only. Because would you listen to someone that spent 50 grand on me? As opposed to a pretty little advert in Facebook? Well, Steve, I hope that one day we get to have that drink at that bar. And from what I know about you, it's probably going to be over a bottle of whiskey of some sort. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> when we do, I-, I can't wait to keep talking with you. So Steve, um, Steve Sims, guys, he's the author of Bluefishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Um, he also owns his own consulting and coaching firm. Uh, like he said, his website does not have a phone number or an email address on it, but you can visit that website. So, Steve, if you don't mind, just share everybody how they can reach out to you and connect with you. Well, there's a couple of ways. You can jump into a Facebook page called An Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims. That's free of charge. and He's got a load of my babblings and videos and stuff like that in it. It's a pretty good group. Um, or you can go to stevedsims.com and uh, subscribe to my newsletter and get a PDF of the art of making things happen, uh, which is the cheat sheet from the book. So there's a couple of ways through Facebook or through stevedsims.com. And Sims is only one M. Well, this was a true honor. Uh, I, I've, I've known about you for a long time. Love the book, love everything you have to say. And, and can, um, it can tell you from personal experience when you really change the way you think about your customers, whether it's your actual customers or your employees, your entire life changes because you're always listening. You're always wanting to, to make something happen and make someone smile. So I, I hope there's at least one person, if not hopefully more listening to this, that their life will change like I have after reading this great book of yours. So thanks for putting so much effort into this interview and that great book. And I can't wait to again, have that shot of whiskey with you down the road. So thanks, Steve. Cheers, pal. See you soon. You bet. Kyle Davis here from Business Development. Thank you so much for listening to the Cleaning Up Podcast. If you found this episode valuable, then please subscribe on your favorite listening platform and please share it with your friends. If you're ever interested in going into business for yourself and purchasing a franchise, then don't hesitate to reach out. You can get a hold of me at phone number 205-870-8643, email kyled at ineedamade.com, or visit us online at twomaidsfranchise.com to learn more.